You think the crisis in Europe doesn't matter to you? Think again. If the Eurozone collapses, your savings, your job and your pension could all be at risk. Whatever is going on in the European economy now in terms of contraction actually could easily turn into a depression and uh, widespread social unrest. On the day that the head honcho of the European Commission described the crisis as a baptism of fire for a whole generation, and the Bank of England warned banks here to prepare for the worst, can or should the euro survive? The schemes and scheming of politicians are one thing, but as Greece has discovered, when a currency fails, there are human casualties. My outrage is uh, on a daily basis, when I go out and I'm very sad, I'm very gloom. Does Germany have the will to pull Europe back from the abyss? We're in Berlin, ahead of a crucial vote tomorrow. And what does Ed Miliband, the wonk who got the leadership, really think about market forces? Yeah, and I'm in favour of capitalism, just for the record, but it's what kind of capitalism you have. Good evening. As statements of the blindingly obvious go, it's certainly a record contender. The European Union is facing its greatest challenge, according to no less an authority than Jose Manuel Barroso, the capo di tutti capi in the European Commission. It's turned out, though, that the so-called plans to save the euro are a lot less substantial than they seemed to be a couple of days ago. The image problem of this 17-headed Jedward can be solved by much further integration. Oh, and by the way, we need to levy a financial tax which could clobber the city of London. Now, let's go through this mess bit by bit with our economics editor, Paul Mason. So where are we up to so far? Well, it all revolves around the fate of the EFSF, which is the bailout, the expanded bailout plan. If it is passed, we get 440 billion euros to spend or Europe does, and it can spend it on bailing out countries and banks. So, the Finns passed their bit of it today. We think the Germans will probably pass their bit of it through their parliament tomorrow. Greece has done its bit and passed an austerity plan, yet to implement it, of course. And so where are we there? That takes us back to 21st of July. That's where we were two months ago, three ne nearly. But since then, things have moved on. Uh, the economy's flattened out. Banks are in a much worse situation than they were. The Bank of England today warning even our banks to get ready for more stress in the system. So really, the politicians, that generation which is going through this baptism, baptism of fire, is really struggling to catch up with where we are. So where are we going? <laughs> well, we've been looking now at the scenarios for what could happen. Um, if you expand the 450 billion to 2 trillion, as was mooted at the weekend, or if you don't, and if you don't, what happens if you then get a chaotic slide out of the euro by uh, the Greeks? I've been discussing this uh, with a couple of experts and got the, sa the chance to sit in a flashy car. Currency unions are always designed as permanent and forever, but in history they don't usually last much longer than a decent car. Greece joined the EC the same year as the ill-fated DeLorean was launched, which prompts the question. What's the difference between a DeLorean and the Eurozone? Well, one is a great 1980s design concept that fell victim to dodgy finance, and the DeLoreans had its problems too. Of course, a car like this is a great vehicle in which to go back to the future. Now, Greece and the Euro are facing a bleak choice of futures. Even the most realistic scenario contains explicit dangers. Last night, Greece voted through the crucial tax rise that should see it get the 8 billion euros it needs to survive. Even now, there are stories of teachers, policemen not being paid, so they're cutting it fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Finns today voted through the 440 billion euro plan for an expanded bailout fund, and Germany probably will tomorrow. So what's next? Well, I hope what they will try and do is a minimum of three things. Get a default template for Greece, which could be used for other countries if necessary recapitalize the bank so they can take their losses and move on 
and ensure that the European Central Bank stands ready to buy any amount of Italian and Spanish bonds, providing the liquidity which might be necessary. At the weekend, the G20 mooted a plan to expand the euro bailout to 2 trillion euros by letting the European Central Bank print money and borrow a lot more money. They gave themselves until the G20 summit on 3rd of November to make it work. But German politicians have been quick to squash the idea. So what happens if we get to November and there's no stability? Italy's debt at 120% of GDP looks unsustainable and there are fears that Italy and Spain could get dragged into the danger zone. If there is no mega plan by the Cannes summit of the G20, um, I think not only will the markets be bitterly disappointed because we're not even back to plan A, there isn't a plan A, uh, but I think that we could seriously be in a mode in which we could encounter bank runs, uh, uh, deposit runs, bank failures, uh, and whatever is going on in the European economy now in terms of contraction actually could easily turn into a depression and uh, widespread social unrest. The last uncontrolled default was 10 years ago in Argentina. This is what it looked like. The banks closed, the president left by helicopter, but the country eventually recovered. So what's wrong with doing an Argentina? I think we should be a bit sceptical about the claims that Argentina had such a good time with default and devaluation. It was a traumatic time. The middle class was largely wiped out. They were rescued, not so much, I think, but by default and devaluation, but by a commodity boom that was great for their terms of trade and their export prospects uh, you know, from 2002, 2003, and up until today. Things might have looked very, very different if you hadn't had that commodities boom. And there's no similar boom in sight for any European Eurozone country. Right now, the politicians are discussing everything behind closed doors. But one thing they're open about is that nobody should leave the euro. And if you fast rewind back to the 1930s, you can see why. A euro exit for Greece could be contagious. In the 1930s, once one country left the gold standard, under the pressure of social unrest, others followed. Germany, Britain, Japan. And this is what happened to growth in the 30s. The countries that left gold and pursued expansionist and protectionist policies recovered first. America and France, which clung to the currency peg, recovered last. And the problem with any repeat of that, a chaotic breakup of a currency peg, is this. It could collapse Europe's banks. At UBS, we've tried to quantify the impact on countries like Greece and Germany of a euro failure and it's a huge huge quantity of GDP in in Greece's case it could be as much as 60 to 80 percent of GDP in uh, Germany's case it could be between 30 and 40 percent but th these is, this is just guesswork right now the future for Europe looks quite random and depends on forces that are moving beyond the control of governments and the whole arrangement does begin to look simultaneously futuristic and archaic. Well, with us now to discuss the Eurozone, we have Amadou Altafraj Tadio, a spokesman for the European Commission. He joins us from uh, the continent. Johanna Kirkland, who is a fund manager with Schroeder Investment Management. Peter O'Born, a journalist with The Telegraph. And Sir Richard Lambert, who, as well as being an ex head of the CBI, once edited the Financial Times. Um, Let's look at it from Brussels first of all. Would you like to apologise, uh, Mr. Altafresh Tadio, for the lack of European leadership on this crisis? I don't think we have to apologise, but we have to call for a strong uh, political will and a strong political response from European leaders uh, to prevail over all these uh, market fears and all the narrow-minded uh, nationalisms. Uh, this is the risk that we have to avoid. We have to have a, a strong uh, European response to a problem that uh, has an uh, impact in all European citizens from uh, Athens to London, from uh, Madrid to Helsinki. So you believe that Europe's leaders are in control of events, do you? Yes, I think so. Uh, European uh, political leaders are taking very uh, difficult discussion, decisions. 
it is very hard, for instance, uh, to uh, confront the public opinion with measures of austerity. Mm -hmm. uh, politicians uh, usually don't like uh, to do that. Uh, they know that they, this has a political cost for them, but still they are responsible enough to tell uh, their citizens that uh, accumulating debt uh, and accumulating risks is, uh, is uh, the most antisocial uh, behavior and therefore they are ready to uh, take this criticism and they are ready to discuss with their European partners. Um, why don't the markets believe you? Because there is uh, something more than market logics here at stake. This is a, a political construction. Uh, we have kept the solidarity uh, since the, the end of the Second World War. This is a political project and we believe that this is the best uh, way to ensure prosperity for our citizens, to maintain uh, a welfare system that uh, has no uh, comparison uh, all over the world. So there is a strong political will to keep uh, these objectives and therefore markets should believe that we will not let Greece uh, down, we will not uh, and we cannot uh, avoid default by Greece for instance because the implications of such, uh, such a development would be uh, brutal for our citizens. Um, the British Foreign Secretary William Hague has described the Euro as a burning building with no exits. Uh, I fully disagree and I think that uh, there is a strong commitment by European leaders in the Eurozone and outside the Eurozone and even elsewhere. Uh, for instance, we were in Washington in the IMF annual meetings a few days ago and uh, even uh, politicians from, uh, from the US, uh, from uh, China, from the emerging economies were encouraging uh, the Euro to take decisions and to uh, provide a strong European response. So I don't understand why Mr. Haig will be uh, less uh, convinced than, uh, for instance, Mr. Tinkiner in the United States. Uh, Joanna Kirkland, why don't the markets um, take the same view of things? Well, I think that um, the concern that markets are expressing is about the institutional framework in Europe and whether it's designed to make quick decisions. And I think the reality is that so far what we've seen over the last year is that there isn't a framework that allows quick decision making. And that's what you need in these kinds of markets. So, so what they really don't like is precisely what we've just heard admitted, yes. which is this is a political project more than anything else. Well, I think the fact that it's a political project, I mean, that's fine, and I don't think the markets are necessarily questioning that. But a political project does need to be supported by institutions that can cope with whatever the world economy throws at them. And the reality is that at the moment, those institutions haven't been apparent. Mm. And I think in particular, um, you know, so far all we've had is um, basically a case of European leaders saying, don't worry, it'll be all right, we won't let Greece, let Greece go, without giving us any detail as to exactly how they're going to do that. Peter Oborn, what did you make of uh, what we heard from Brussels there? It's mad, actually. It's really uh, weird. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The idea this is a political problem, excuse me, mate, he's over there on the screen, um, it's an economic problem. It's a, the, the euro is collapsing under the weight of its own contradictions, uh, and the idea that political will can solve an economic problem runs against the basic insight of no under, none other than Karl Marx, which is that economics, in the end, trumps politics. These guys are in total and utter denial. Mm. It's terribly frightening listening to that idiot in Brussels. Uh, Mr. Idiot in Brussels, would you like to respond? Uh, no, I think that uh, these words speak for themselves. Okay. Just one thing, uh, this is not about being outside or inside the euro area. For instance, the UK uh, in 2010 had a deficit which was exactly the same than Greece. So it's not the euro that's the problem. The euro. Uh, is in fact uh, a shield that has protected many of our economies and that is a factor of stability and prosperity. Uh, we went uh, through the most uh, difficult crisis <laughs> since the end of the Second World War and all countries have experienced that. Richard Lambert, you actually wanted us to join the Euro at one point, didn't you? Yeah, we felt back in the 90s uh, that the Euro was going to happen, whether Britain was part of it or not, that these I, were our major trading partners I, I and that the wrong. risks of going in well, greater than the risk of staying out. Yeah, but you were wrong. The facts changed. The facts changed. I mean, what happened was the rules weren't obeyed. Uh, France and Germany uh, broke the rules. Uh, the uh, banks were undercapitalized. Massive capital imbalances across the euro area weren't fixed. And when the biggest financial shock in 100 years came along, the euro was in a bad place. Can I um, just come in on this? Of point? course, you, you were would, yes. editor of the Financial Times during this period. It was predicted very, very clearly by a large number of people. Margaret Thatcher, William Hague, the Tory leader, who the FT sneered at day in and day out, 
The FT didn't give this story proper economic analysis. It saw it. It took the line of that idiot in Brussels that this is a political project. And you didn't, you, even though you were a financial newspaper, you didn't apply economic analysis. You took the political view. And by the way, I've got a book. I've got a present for you when I heard you're coming on this program. Guilty men. You're one of them. And I suggest you read it. It analyzes the performance. It goes on with it analyzes the performance of the Jeremy, Financial uh, Times. Let, can I ask him a question? Yeah. Guilty men was a phrase used by yes. Michael Foote in 1940. In, in 1940, about it was about people who appeased the Nazis. Yeah. In your view, is uh, Chancellor Merkel, is President Barroso, are they today's equivalents of the Nazi party? Well, they, well, no, they, you were, you are one of a group of people who, had, we, had you had your way, we would now be in the position of Greece. We'd be taking orders from the EU and the IMF. Britain's economic uh, security would have been destroyed. Our political independence would no longer exist if the Financial do, Times had had its way. Do we want in, to go on like this, or should we talk about what's happening now? Do we want to go Let's on talk it, about Greece. Yeah. Do you accept that it is now likely that Greece will fall out of the euro? I think it is likely, yes. I think, my, personally, I feel yeah. uh, that the numbers now are impossible to manage. And, and the... It seems to me there are two, a number of scenarios. On the one hand, I think the, the extreme positions, namely mm. a collapse of the euro, is very unlikely because the economic and political consequences would be a disaster. I think a fiscal union is very unlikely. The question is, is it possible to get an orderly way of getting, uh, getting Germany and Greece uh, to withdraw from the, European, uh, from the eurozone? Is it possible to do that? I think it might be. And I think it's something that... Uh, getting Germany to withdraw from the eurozone? No, no, getting Germany to support... Greece in a withdrawal. In withdrawal. Yeah, because they would need massive liquidity, yeah, massive support for their banks. And what's, the, what's the received wisdom? Uh, I know it changes from day to day in the yeah. markets, but go on. What, what is it as of now about Greece, Greece's future? Well, I think actually if, the, if Greece was actually to withdraw from the euro, that would be potentially extremely destabilising mm. because of the impact that would have on the Greek banking system. I think there is certainly a need to restructure the debt. But our hope would be that they could restructure their debt without having to leave the euro, because I think that would really um, massively increase the chances of contagion to the rest of Europe if that was to unless, happen. Unless it were possible for the ECB no. and for Germany yeah, to well, provide fiscal support I think and liquidity. That, yeah, I think those fire breaks can help if Greece is restructuring its debt. Yeah. I don't know if they can help. I don't, think, I don't think if they can help necessarily to offset the consequences of Greece leaving the euro. I think that might be a fire that's just too big. And to Peter Oborn, you think that Greece will fall out? Well, it's inevitable that the Greeks were for... And, of course, it's enormously in the Greek interest to get out of the euro, because the moment it does, it will be able to be competitive. And the, one of the points which n nobody's quite made here is the total inhumanity of the euro. The euro is destroying the livelihoods of millions of Greek businesses, millions of Greek okay. people. We're going to hear a bit from Greece yeah. and some of the human and, 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 consequences. And the, what, the, what the euro elite, the, this idiot in Brussels, Will doesn't you stop seem referring to... to me as this idiot? That is just No, he is. You, you listen to the low you quality, the catastrophic he, quality of his economic analysis. You may think that he's, he, he's yeah. out of contact with reality, but that does not mean he's now walking out of the studio in Brussels. Good. Well done. We, can't, we yeah. can't even hold him to account now. <laughs> Because you've just been gratuitously offensive to it's, it. Uh, well, unfortunately, listening to this man talking such but nonsense over a matter of such importance which affects the lives of millions and millions of people, and listening to that nonsense, it's offensive to decent people who want jobs. What about this proposition that we heard earlier today from Mr Barroso, who is presumably the boss yeah. of our friend in Brussels, who's just walked out of the studio? Um, his... He's, he clearly believes there is a solution, and the solution is stronger political union and fiscal union. Is that even a starter, given what's happened to the euro? I think it's unlikely, uh, because yeah. uh, for two reasons. One is just the, the time it would take, uh, treaty revisions, political dramas mm -hmm. that would take place on the way. Two is it wouldn't address the fundamental problem which has emerged, which is that the southern European countries are a lot less competitive than the northern European countries. That, you know, they're, they're, were they to be locked into a fiscal union, they would face years of austerity and of uh, the only way they could get a competitive place would be if their yeah. prices fell year after year after year. And that, yeah, and that's Kirsten, I, mean, I mean, is he in fantasy land there? Well, I think that... Um, 
actually the issue is you can't keep imposing austerity on the southern European economies because that's not going to sort out their debt problems. They've got to because, grow. Yeah, because the problem is it's probably going to have a bigger impact on the GDP than it will on the debt. I think ultimately Germany has to step in and say that it's willing to bail out its neighbours and that ultimately that money will be flown from northern okay, Europe well, to southern Europe. Okay, well we're going to hear Europe. from Germany um, shortly, but it is Greece which has brought the Eurozone to meltdown. There are plenty of wise after the event Knowles who say blithely, well, of course, they should never have been allowed in. But they were, and now the people of Greece have to pay the price of earlier official lies and fecklessness. Because in the end, political projects and politicians' hubris have consequences for people. As Paul Mason has discovered in Athens, there are human casualties. This summer, Syntagma Square became a theatre of economic war. Now, with the stones of Syntagma permanently scarred, the worry is, so is Greek society. The danger for Greece just right now is that Greeks are going to feel alone and totally hopeless. They are going to abandon any pretense and not go out writing but stop conforming to any sort of rules. Among politicians, sociologists, protesters, one word keeps coming up when they try to describe what might be happening to Greek society. It is anomi, as in, from the Greek, absence of law. It's not the overthrow of government people are worried about. It's the gradual dissolution of all the bonds that tie society together. <laughs> From the ages of, let's say, 15 or 16 to 25 or 30, young people in Greece expect nothing from society, from uh, the political system, even from their, their elders. Their hope resides in their family and their friends. Once more, is that going to be enough? Might be yes, might be no. If it's a no, if it's a resolute no, then this sort of explosion is going to make the Molotov bomb throwing of uh, last, last month to seem almost a joke. When Greek teenagers went back to school this month, they found a shortage of everything. In a society that values education highly, it's become a symbol of malaise. They didn't give us uh, books. They give us CD. 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 Yeah, in PC. But uh, someone who hasn't PC can't read. That is, and we want to to bring us books. No CDs. No, no nothing. See, more only books. People say there's no money to pay for the books. There's more, no money to pay for the things you want. There is money, but they give them to the company. They give, them, they give the money to the companies to survive from the crisis, from the crisis and we have to pay them. Why? We, we don't make the crisis. Their parents are facing layoffs, reduced hours, unpaid bills, and there's a sense that the basic social contract, pay tax and get an education, is breaking down. They returned their CDs to Parliament with a defiance that's become routine. But the majority of Greeks have not been on the demonstrations. In this quiet suburb of Athens, there's frustration of a different kind. Mary is a freelance teacher, Demetrius an estate agent. They're part of a private sector feeling the real squeeze of austerity. A combination of tax rises and a business downturn has halved their income in two years. The money started to decrease. We uh, realized that we weren't able to buy the things that we used to buy before. So now we only buy the basics. And now, uh, a few days lately, we aren't able to buy even those. Most people would look at your home and 
think of you as middle class. We are middle class, actually, yes, and uh, we were used to a very high standard of life, let's say. We used to go out with friends very often. We invited friends over to have dinner and barbecues and that stuff. Now I have to invite a friend for a year. What do you think? For a year. Yes, because I can't afford it. Have either of you been on a demonstration? No, mm -hmm. I haven't and uh, I won't actually no. because I think it's vain. My outrage is uh, on a daily basis when I go out and I'm very sad and very gloom because uh, I see the future is quite uh, pessimistic, let's say. I don't know what's going to happen to my kids and uh, I can't find an outlet. In the next phase of the crisis, what matters is the way people react in places like this, the quiet suburbs, because we don't really understand what happens if the middle class of a developed country just switch off from politics and lose hope. The figures tell their own story. Suicides up 40% in a year, thefts and break-ins have doubled in two years, there is open hostility to migrants and vagrancy has become a major problem. And the open lawlessness goes beyond St. Agnes Square. The village of Keratea became a no-go area for police after locals rejected the sighting of a rubbish dump. When in your neighborhood you have the feeling that it's been taken over by unruliness, you don't have the reflex even of controlling your own behavior. Life in the city, not only in Athens, but also all around, that, all around Greece, comes crumbling down. Normal life gets more and more difficult. These little things happening every day are far more important than the overall deficit situation or the banking crisis. It's like a low intensity conflict and it's happening in the strangest of places. I was told to turn up at a courthouse. There was to be an auction of repossessed homes. But the can't pay, won't pay campaign got there first. The campaign started with the non-payment of road tolls. Their aim now is to prevent the collection of the two billion emergency property tax passed this week. I am uh, a company for the, uh, advertising. Advertising? Yes. It's unusual to see company advertising people protesting in a court. Uh, why? Greek people uh, have uh, lost we have lost our life. We have lost our life. Oh, everything. These protesters are drawn from the very classes that frequent the cafes around Syntagma. Professionals, small business owners, the unlikeliest of rebels. You're not worried that by doing this, you create some kind of social breakdown where the whole bonds of Greek society just start falling apart? I don't believe that this situation is anarchy. We pay those, those taxes we owe to pay, not the illegal taxes, not the taxes uh, that became from an order somewhere else outside the Greece. Greeks know, whoever they vote for, that the euro and their own debt dictates what happens next. There's a sense of listlessness, and among political scientists, fear of the unknown. If we face a system of a potential social mm. collapse, how far away are we from that? It might come very sudden. It might come in a flash, because the, fee the feeling, the, the sense of helplessness is very intense just right now. 
when the issue was economics and the protests were led by the traditional left, the dynamics were at least predictable. This new problem of anomie, low-level conflict and quiet despair injects uncertainty. And you can see it on the faces of nearly every social group. Well, we've been joined now in the studio by Katinka Barish of the Centre for European Reform. Do you get the feeling that European leaders are quite aware of what some of the social consequences of this may be? Um, I believe so, because it's been reported enough. The discussions at the moment are more about also Greece being put on a long-term reform plan. This isn't only about Greece trying to squeeze another euro or five out of its budget, but does this country actually, is it on course to have a viable economic model, or does it need to be propped up in perpetuity? But you saw there that a country that some of those people sounded absolutely at the end of their tether. Mm. This is clearly, potentially, a place of social breakdown. Yes. And that's a price worth risking, is it? No, I wouldn't I definitely wouldn't say so. There is at the moment the idea but that the euro can be rescued by imposing austerity on all European countries at the same time is clearly crazy. So what they need to do, what Greece needs to do first and foremost is to restructure its debt and then come up with a long term sure. plan of restructuring and 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 basically moving to an economic model where it makes things that people want to buy. But in the meantime, there are really serious risks of social breakdown. I saw, I saw that in the, in yeah. the shocking report, yes. Um, it is, it's the, the IMF and the ECB and the European Commission negotiating with the Greek government at the moment about what needs to be done. There is a second bailout just going through the system for Greece. And I don't know where the balance will be struck in the end. Now, in the end, whether the euro and indeed uh, the dreams of Europe's political elite lives or dies is a matter in the hands or the bank account of the German people. The Parliament in Berlin meets tomorrow to decide whether it likes the idea of increasing the bailout fund. Peter Marshall is in Berlin. What do you think is going to happen, Peter? Well, it's confidently expected the Parliament will approve the bailout fund tomorrow. The question is, will Angela Merkel get sufficient support from her own centre-right coalition to pass it, or will she face such a rebellion from her own supporters, so disgusted are many of them at the, the, the Greek bailout and the apparently profligate Greeks, that she'll have to rely on the opposition. And that would be hugely embarrassing for, for Chancellor Merkel, and it would undermine the stability of, of the ruling coalition. At the moment, it's very much in the balance. Uh, it needs 19 rebels to, uh, to force her into a corner. And at the moment, it looks like there could well be 19 rebels. We'll see. Uh, what's your feeling about whether the Germans are likely to back the much bigger bailout that's being talked about as being the thing that's really necessary? Well, on the face of it, that's not going to move at all tomorrow because that's not, not, not what's on the table. On the table, uh, that they're looking backwards, in fact, at a measure that, that uh, they supposedly approved two months ago. That's on the face of it. Everybody suspects, though, that this is a Trojan horse measure, and behind that there will be a lot of undeclared baggage and further billions going to help the, the Greeks. And people don't necessarily like that. We've been in Wolfsburg today, uh, where VW have their headquarters. Now, it's a place which has done very well out of the euro. It's based on, on exports, and they've, they've profited from the euro. But even there, people are suspicious of pouring good money after bad, as they see it, and they're worried about the accountability of it all. They're not too happy at all, despite the assurances from the German finance minister that there's no more money to go after tomorrow's round. Peter, thank you. Now, Katinka, do you think Angela Merkel is strong enough, politically strong enough, to save the euro? Not single-handedly, surely not. No, no European leader would be able to do that. Um, but it is, of course, true that everybody at the moment is looking towards Berlin and what the Germans are going to decide. Although she can't do it single-handedly, a German veto frustrates any plan. Sure, but I mean, the finance minister, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Schäuble, has already said that this much bigger f fund is out of the question. He has to say that at the moment because otherwise the vote tomorrow won't go through. Um, so we shouldn't but I take also, it at his words at face value? Of course it's not the last word.
I mean, they've, they've said this before the German politicians. The first Greek bailout was going to be a one-off. The European Financial Stability Facility was going to be a temporary thing. Of, no, of course, now it's going to be permanent. The ECB was no, never going to buy bonds. Of course, it's buying bonds now. This is not the last word from the German government. But they have to take it step by step. And once they have the, the new rules on the bailout fund in place, they'll take the next step. It's very, it must be very interesting. All this stuff is being said to placate the markets. Yes. Uh, but the markets are canny enough, presumably, to see through it, aren't they? Well, I think, again, I mean, you were asking the question, uh, can Angela Merkel save Europe? And I think, ultimately, it, it does come down to Germany saving Europe, unfortunately. Yes, other countries like France can contribute but to the FSF, but ultimately, without, especially if you want to expand the size of the FSF, it'll be Germany will be footing that bill. It won't be France, it won't be Finland, it won't be the other AAA-rated countries, it will be Germany. So I think, ultimately, it is about Angela Merkel. But the markets must already be discounting every assurance that they get from a European politician. Yes, I think certainly we've learned to, to disregard um, you know, uh, statements because we've seen a lot of promises and we haven't seen many facts yet. I mean, there's been a bit of hope just over the last couple of days because there's a feeling that maybe that there's something coming out of the G20, but, yeah. This dishonesty on the part of politicians is, of course, a great part of the problem, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I mean, it's... It's Katinka, the language Katinka was using is why, essentially, they've been consistently behind the curve mm -hmm. over, the, over the last months. You know, action that they took in July, had they taken that, you know, at the turn of the year, that might have been a firebreak. They're always behind because they have to appease their domestic constituencies, and there isn't a sort of single strong uh, influence. Uh, you know, like at the G20 back in 2008, there was a central initiative, there was a central drive for a bit to get stuff done. That seems to have dissipated. I think that's what's worrying. Go on, it's, the go on. it's the interplay between markets and politics that's very concerning here because, in theory, a stitch in time does save nine, and if they'd done everything, put some measures in place right at the beginning, we wouldn't have got into this mess. And political risk course, is very difficult for people like you yes, to price. You don't know, I mean, you can do economics, but politics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. and but so politically, the reality was politically that this is an entirely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend the, the European leadership here, but politically, surely it is much more difficult to make these huge steps up front and try to convince your voters, OK, guys, the yeah. situation doesn't look very serious, but we're just going to make two and a half trillion euros available. Or, you know, the situation that we're in now, so, where, Europe, yeah. where Europe is burning, and then you go to your voters and say, actually, you know what, we have no choice but to make this money available. So politically, it's, a, it's, the, it's much the, easier to yeah. be behind the curve, which is probably why we're there. I actually can, agree can with you. I, I, mean, I, I want to raise that's one other point. What happens if the euro turns out not to be as robust as these rather disconnected politicians seem to think. What happens if the euro does just fall apart? Richard, what do you think? Well, I think that the poss possibility of that is so serious that I think you can discount it. It's not completely impossible, but if were it to happen, uh, we would see something of a, a, a depression across uh, Europe, and it would spread across the world of a kind that we haven't seen uh, since before the war. And we would see the political glue that has held Europe together since the war uh, Dissipate. So it's really serious, and that's why I don't think it's going to happen. I think they will be going for big sticking plasters, and the bigger the better. Uh, but it's a risk. What do you think, Johanna? Yes, I agree. I mean, I think, unfortunately, the consequences of, of such a breakup would be so serious that I think, ultimately, they will step back from the brink. Because the reality is what you would see is, you know, a collapse in the currencies in, in the peripheral economies, the banking systems would collapse. Um, but this is a project conceived in political hubris perpetuated by political dishonesty, and they now seem to be completely unsure about what they should do apart from accruing more powers to themselves. I think ultimately they know what they need to do. It's just that they have to get the electorate on board, and that's part of the problem that they're facing. I think that, that, that behind closed doors, you know, they, they understand the commitments they need to make. So, and the markets believe that's what's going to happen. I mean, I'm asking you to generalise in a ridiculous way, but that is, that is, that's what you intuit to be the case. Yes, I think we think that ultimately we will get a package in place. But, you know, the risks are significant at this point. And as, as, as you were saying, Richard, the problem is that with, with um, political risk, it, it's very hard to, to, make, to make sensible forecasts. We're much more used to, to, to analyse an economic environment. And this is really why it's difficult for investors to, to place any kind of money into the market in a serious sense, because ultimately we're reliant on what the politicians decide to come up with, and that's very hard to forecast. Okay, thank you all very much.